In the East Indian seas, by Europeans and natives alike, two names are revered with a singleness and devotion that place them side by side with the national heroes of all countries. The men that bear the names are Englishmen, yet the countless islands of the vast Malayan archipelago are populated by a hundred European, African, and Asiatic races. Sir Stamford Raffles founded the great city of Singapore, and Sir James Brooke, the White Raja, carved out of a tropical wilderness just across the equator in Borneo, the kingdom of Sarawak. There is no one man in all history with whom you may compare Raja Brooke. His career was the score of a hero of the footlights or of the dime novel rather than the life of an actual history maker in this prosaic 19th century. What is true of him is also true in a less degree of his famous nephew and successor Sir Charles Brooke, GCMC, the present Raja. One morning in Singapore, as I sipped my tea and broke open one cool, delicious mango steen after another, I was reading in the Daily Straits Times an account of the descent of a band of head-hunting Dayaks from the jungles of the Rajang River in Borneo on an isolated fishing kampong, or village, of how they killed men, women, and children, and carried their heads back to their strongholds in triumph, and of how in the midst of their feasting and ceremonies, Raja Brooke, with a little company of fierce native soldiery, had surprised and exterminated them to the last man. And just then, the sound of heavy cannonading in the harbor below caused me to drop my paper. In a moment, the great guns from Fort Canning answered. I counted 17 and turned inquiringly to the naked Punkab Wallab, who stood just outside in the shade of the wide veranda, listlessly pulling the rattan rope that moved the stiff fan above me. His brown open palm went respectfully to his forehead. His Highness, the Raja of Sarawak, he answered proudly in Malay. He come in gunboat Rene to the Gymkhana races. Bring gold cup for prizes and fast runners. Come every year to an. I had forgotten that it was the first day of the long-looked-for Gymkhana races. A few hours later, I met this remarkable man whose thrilling exploits had commanded my earliest boyish admiration. The kindly old sultan of Johor, the old rebel sultan of Pahang, the sultan of Lingay, in all the finery of their native silks and jewels, the nobles of their courts and a dozen other dignitaries were on the grand stand in the paddock as we entered, yet no one but a modest gray-haired little man by the side of the English governor had any place in my thoughts. We knew his history. It was as romantic as the wild careers of Pizarro and Cortez, as charming as those of Robinson Crusoe and the dear old Swiss family Robinson, as tragic as Captain Kidd's or Morgan's, and withal, it was modeled after our own Washington. In him I saw the full realization of every boy's wildest dreams, a king of a tropical island. The bell above the judge's pavilion sounded, and a little whirlwind of running griffins dashed by amid the yells of a thousand natives in a dozen different tongues. The Raja leaned out over the gaily decorated railing with the eagerness of a boy as he watched his own colors in the thick of the race. The surging mass of nakedness below caught sight of him, and another yell ran to the air, quite distinct from the first. For Malayan and Kling, Tamil and Siamese, Dayak and Javanese, Hindu, Bugis, Burmese, and Laskar recognized the famous white Raja of Borneo, the man who, all unaided, had broken the power of the savage head-hunting Dayaks and driven from the seas the fierce Malayan pirates. The yell was not a cheer. It was a tribute that a tiger might make to his tamer. The Raja understood he was used to such sinister outbursts of admiration, for he never took his eyes from the course. He was secure on his throne now, but I could not but wonder if that yell, which sent a strange thrill through me, did not bring up recollections of one of the hundred sanguinary scenes through which he and his great uncle, the elder Raja Brooke, had gone when fighting for their lives and kingdom. The Sultan of Johor's Griffin won, and the Raja stepped back to congratulate congratulate him. I too passed over to where he stood, and the kindly old sultan took me by the hand. I have a very tender spot in my heart for all Americans, the Raja replied to his highness's introduction. It was your great republic that first recognized the independence of Sarawak. As we chatted over the triumph of Gladstone, the silver bill, the tariff, and a dozen topics of the day, I was thinking of the headhunters of whom I had read in the morning paper. I was thinking, too, of how this man's uncle had, years before, with a boat's crew of English boys carved out of an unknown island a principality larger than the state of New York reduced its savage population to orderly tax-paying citizens, cleared the Borneo and Java Seas of their thousands of pirate prowls, 
and in their place built up a merchant fleet into commerce of nearly five millions of dollars a year. The younger Raja too had done his share in the making of the state. In his light tweed suit and black English derby, he did not look the strange impossible hero of romance I had painted him, but there was something in his quiet, clear, well-bred English accent and the strong, deep lines about his eyes and mouth that impressed one with a consciousness of tremendous reserve force. He spoke always slowly, as though wearied by early years of fighting and exposure in the searching heat of the Bornean sun. We became better acquainted later at balls and dinners, and he was never tired of thanking me for my country's kindness. In 1819, when the English took Malacca and the Malay Peninsula from the Dutch, they agreed to surrender all claims to the islands south of the pirate-infested Straits of Malacca. The Dutch, contented with the fabulously rich island of Java and its 26 millions of mild-mannered natives, left the great islands of Sumatra, Borneo, and Papua to the savage rulers and savage nations that held them. The son of an English clergyman, on a little schooner with a friend or two and a dozen sailors, sailed into these little-known and dangerous waters one day 19 years later. His mind was filled with dreams of an East Indian empire. He was burning to emulate Cortez and Pizarro without practicing their abuses. He had entered the English army and had been so dangerously wounded while leading a charge in India after his superiors had fallen that he had been retired on a pension before his 21st year. While regaining his health, he had traveled through India, Malaya, and China and had written a journal of his wanderings. During this period, his ambitions were crowding him on to an enterprise that was as foolhardy as the first voyage of Columbus. He had spied those great tropical islands that touched the equator and he coveted them. After his father's death, he invested his little fortune in a schooner and in spite of all the protests and prayers of his family and friends, he sailed for Singapore and thence across to the northwest coast of Borneo, landing at Kuching on the Sarawak River in 1838. He had no clearly outlined plan of operations, he was simply waiting his chance. The province of Sarawak, a dependency of the Sultan of Borneo, was governed by an old native Raja, whose authority was menaced by the fierce head-hunting Dayaks of the interior. Brooke's chance had come. He boldly offered to put down the rebellion if the Raja would make him his general and second to the throne. The Raja cunningly accepted the offer, eager to let the harebrained young infidel annoy his foes, but with no intention of keeping his promise. After days of marching with his little crew and a small army of natives through the almost impenetrable rubber jungles, after a dozen hard-fought battles and deeds of personal heroism, any one of which would make a story, the headhunters were crushed and some kind of order restored. He refused to allow the Raja to torture the prisoners, thereby winning their gratitude, and he refused to be dismissed from his office. He had won his rank, and he appealed to the Sultan. The wily Sultan recognized that in this stranger he had found a man who would be able to collect his revenue, and much to Brooke's surprise, a courier entered Kuching, the capital, one day and summarily dismissed the native Raja and proclaimed the young Englishman Raja of Sarawak. Brooke was a king at last. His empire was before him, but he was only king because the reigning sultan relinquished a part of his dominions that he was unable to control. The tasks to be accomplished before he could make his word law were ones that England, Holland, and the navies of Europe had shirked. His so-called subjects were the most notorious and daring pirates in the history of the world. They were headhunters, they practiced slavery, and they were cruel and bloodthirsty on land and sea. Out of such elements, this boy king built his kingdom. How he did it would furnish tales that would outdo Verne, Kingston, and Stevenson. He abolished military marauding and every form of slavery, established courts, missions, and schoolhouses, and waged war single-handedly against headhunting and piracy. Headhunting is to the Dayaks what amok is to the Malays or scalping to the American Indians. It is even more, no Dayak woman would marry a man who could not decorate their home with at least one human head. Often bands of Dayaks numbering from five to 7,000 would sally forth from their fortifications and cruise along the coast four or 500 miles to surprise a village and carry the inhabitants' heads back in triumph. Today, headhunting is practically stamped out, as is running amok among the Malays, although cases of each occur from time to time. As his subjects in the jungles were headhunters, so those of the coast were pirates. Every harbor was a pirate haven. They lived in big towns, possessed forts and cannon, and acknowledged neither the suzerainty of the sultan or the domination of the Dutch. They were stronger than the native rulers, and no European nation would go to the great expense of life and treasure needed to break their power. 
Brooke knew that his title would be but a mockery as long as the pirates commanded the mouths of all his rivers. With his little schooner armed with three small guns and manned by a crew of white companions and Dayak sailors, he gave battle first to the weaker strongholds, gradually attaching the defeated to his standard. He found himself at the end of nine years their master and a king in something more than name. Combined with the qualities of a fearless fighter, he had the faculty of winning the goodwill and admiration of his foes. The fierce Salus and Illinums became his fast friends. He left their chiefs in power, but punished every outbreak with a merciless hand. One of the many incidents of his checkered career shows that his spirit was all-powerful among them. He had invited the Chinese from Amoy to take up their residence at his capital, Kuching. They were traders and merchants and soon built up a commerce. They became so numerous in time that they believed they could seize the government. The plot was successful, and during a night attack, they overcame the Raja's small guard, and he escaped to the river in his pajamas without a single follower. Sir Charles told me one day, as we conversed on the broad veranda of the consulate, that that night was the darkest in all his great uncle's stormy life. The hopes and work of years were shattered at a single blow, and he was an outcast with a price on his head. The homeless king knelt in the bottom of the prow and prayed for strength and then took up the oars and pulled silently towards the ocean. Near morning, he was abreast of one of the largest Salu forts, the home of his bitterest and bravest foes. He turned the head of his boat to the shore and landed unarmed, and undressed among the pirates. He surrendered his life, his throne, and his honor into their keeping. They listened silently, and then their scarred old chief stepped forward and placed a naked Chris in the white man's hand and kissed his feet. Before the sun went down that day, the white Raja was on his throne again, and 10,000 grim fierce Salus were hunting the Chinese like a pack of bloodhounds. In 1848, Roger Brooke decided to visit his old home in England and ask his countrymen for teachers and missions. His fame had preceded him. All England was alive to his great deeds. There were greetings by enthusiastic crowds wherever he appeared, banquets by boards of trade and gifts of freedom of cities. He was lodged in Balmoral Castle, knighted by the Queen, made Consul General of Borneo, Governor of Labuan, Doctor of Laws by Oxford, and was the Lion of the Hour. He returned to Sarawak, accompanied by European officers and friends, to carry on his great work of civilization and to make of his little tropical kingdom a recognized power. He died in 1868 and was carried back to England for burial, and I predict that at no distant day a grateful people will rise up and ask of England his body, that it may be laid to rest in the yellow sands under the graceful palms of the unknown nation of which he was the Washington. His nephew Sir Charles Brooke, who had also been his faithful companion for many years, succeeded him. Sarawak has today a coastline of over 400 miles, with an area of 50,000 square miles and a population of 300,000 souls. The country produces gold, silver, diamonds, antimony, quicksilver, coal, gutta percha, rubber, canes, rattan, camphor, beeswax, edible bird's nests, sago, tapioca, pepper, and tobacco, all of which find their way to Singapore and thence to Europe and America. The Raja is absolute head of the state, but he is advised by a legislative council composed of two Europeans and five native chiefs. He has a navy of a number of small but effective gunboats and a well-trained and officered army of several hundred men, who look after the wild tribes of the interior of Borneo and guard the great coastline from piratical excursions. Otherwise, they would be useless as his rule is almost fatherly and he is dearly beloved by his people. It is impossible in one short sketch to relate a tenth of the daring deeds and startling adventures of these two white Rajas. Their lives have been written in two bulky volumes, and the American boy who loves stories that rival his favorite authors of adventure will find them by going to the library and asking for the life of the Raja of Sarawak. There is much in this life that might be read by our statesmen and philanthropists with profit. For the building of a kingdom in a jungle of savage men and savage beasts places the name of Book of Borneo among those of the world's great men, as it does among those of the heroes of adventure. One evening, we were pacing back and forth on the deck of the Raja's magnificent gunboat, the Rene. A soft tropical breeze was blowing offshore. Thousands of lights from running rickshaws and bullock carts were dancing along the wide esplanade that separates the city of Singapore from the sea. The strange old world cries from the natives came out to us in a babble of sound. Chinese and Sampans and Malays and Prowls were gliding about our bows and back and forth between the great foreign men of war that overshadowed us. The Orient was on every hand, and I looked wonderingly at the slightly built 
gray-haired man at my side with a feeling that he had stepped from out some wild South Sea tale. Your Highness, I said as we chatted, tell me how you made subjects out of pirates and headhunters when our great nation with all its power and gold has only been able after 100 years to make paupers out of our Indians. Do you see that man? He replied, pointing to a stalwart brown-faced Dayak, who in the blue and gold uniform of Sarawak was leaning idly against the bulwarks. That is the Dato, Lord, Imam, Judge of the Supreme Court of Sarawak. He was one of the most redoubtable of the Salu pirates. My uncle fought him for eight years. In all that time, he never broke his word in battle or in truce. When Sir James was driven from his throne by the Chinese, the Dato Imam fought to reinstate him as his master. Civilization is only skin deep and so is barbarism. Had your country never broken its word and been as just as it is powerful, your red men would have been today where our brown men are, our equals. An hour later, I stepped into my launch, which was lying alongside. The American flag at the peak came down, and the guns of the Rene belched forth the consular salute. I instinctively raised my hat as we glided over the phosphorescent waters of the harbor, for in my thoughts I was still in the presence of one of the great ones of the earth. <laughs>